Good afternoon. Uh, welcome this afternoon uh, to the Mahesh Chandra Regmi Lecture 2015. Uh, we're late sl slightly uh, in terms of the calendar year, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are here. Uh, I'm Deepak Thapa of the Social Science Baha, welcoming you. This is the 13th in the series of the Mahesh Chandra Regmi Lectures that was established in uh, 2003 uh, with the concurrence of Mr. Regmi himself. And it is a tradition that we have been very proud to continue all these years. As hosts, it has been an honor and privilege to invite August lecturers to speak before a Kathmandu audience. And on behalf of Social Science Baha, I would like to thank everyone who has been so gracious to accept our invitation so far. But needless to say, had it not been for the support shown by all of you who come here year after year to the lecture, we would perhaps not have had the same enthusiasm either. And it is also you that we'd like to thank uh, for making the lecture possible. Today's lecture, as everyone knows, is by Shiv Vishwanathan, a well-known thinker from India. Professor Vishwanathan has engaged with the theme of secularism for a long time, and his lecture, uh, which has been slightly modified uh, from the notice that went out, which now reads, Rethinking Secularism, an invitation to an experiment, will surely strike a chord here with us in Nepal. But that is what you came to hear, and not uh, hear me hold forth. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Rajendra Pradhan, the founding chairperson of Social Science Baha, to introduce the speaker. I'm sure it is a task that Rajendra will enjoy, since uh, it's not many times that we get to introduce a personal friend before an audience like this. Dr. Rajendra Pradhan. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Um, I think Deepak has already welcomed you, but uh, let me just say that we had to postpone the 2015 lecture to today, partly on account of uh, Shiv's illness, but partly also, you know, as everything in Nepal today, we can blame it on the earthquake, the, the, the Madesi and the Tharu Andolan, and the unannounced Indian blockade. So all that, you know, they led, made us sort of postpone, postpone this lecture to uh, today. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Shiv Vishwanathan, whom I've known for now nearly 40 years, I think. I was then quite young, I think, we were both away. And, uh, <coughs> but six is not very old, in it? So <laughs> and um, I think that you know, he, he taught me one semester, and after that we became close friends, and through many, many conversations, and coffee, and lunch, and dinner, I learned a lot. And uh, he was, in fact, one of my you know, inspirations to continue with uh, anthropology. Um, now, I'll, I'll, go back, I'll go to, uh, yeah, so I mentioned that, you know, um, ever since those 1970s, late 70s, uh, he's always envied my mustache, I think. He's always called me Mushi, because he, he doesn't grow a mustache, and I've always grown a mustache, and he's always, always envied that. So now to more formal thing, and this is from what you have, I think, read in a flyer and, uh, and, you know, and an email. So Shiv likes to describe himself as a nomad scholar, a nomad scholar. And indeed, he has been moving from one institution to another, and I think more importantly, his interest, scholarly or otherwise, as well as ideas, have ranged far and wide in his very wide world. He completed his uh, PhD from the Department of Sociology in Delhi, where he was a, a research associate, and he taught for a few years. And I was, I think, one of his first students, I think, in one semester. He then moved to the Center for Study of Developing Societies as a research 
fellow. Then after about a decade, he was appointed professor at the Dhirubhai Amban Institute of Information and Communication Technology in Gujarat. Then after about a decade there, he is currently vice professor, currently professor, vice dean, and executive director at the Center for the Study of Science, Society, and Sustainability at the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy. This is in Haryana. He will soon be appointed you know, Professor of Law and Justice at the same university. In addition to, the, to these institutions, he has served as visiting professor to many universities abroad right, in the West, including the University of Maastricht in Holland, Stanford University, Goldsmith College, London, Arizona State University, and Smith College. He's also served as is serving on the editorial board of many journals and as advisor to many institutions. I shall not go into details. Uh, Professor Vishwanathan is described in many places as not only as India's, uh, one of India's leading social scientists, or more specifically anthropologist, but also is also well known as a public intellectual. Perhaps less well known is, is that for a long time he's been a, a political and social activist although he may not like this term, working tire tirelessly for democracy, human rights, and justice. An interdisciplinary thinker, prolific writer, and delightfully bold and eloquent orator, Shiv's articles and writings reflect his dissection of diverse issues with a sharp and critical wit. His wide interests range from cultures of knowledge, cognitive justice, a term he coined, and about which I shall talk a bit later on, urban studies, the sociology of corruption and ethics, the sociology of philosophy of science, and, uh, philosophy of science history of technology and traditional knowledge, social movements, globalization, in, uh, to the cultures, a politics, politics of ecology, disaster management, and a thing called futures. His work has explored, among other issues, the question of alternatives as a dialogue between the West and India, and of course the rest of third world countries, the psychological, cultural, and political relations of science, the growing control of society by technology, and the linkages between scientific establishment and authoritarian structures of state. He has attempted to, dis to demystify modern science and social knowledge as legitimizing categories of organized violence and exploitation. As a public intellectual, his writings, which feature in leading newspapers and magazines, such as the Econo Economic, um, Economic Political Weekly, Seminar, Indian Express, and Hindu, as he writes at least 12 articles a month for these uh, this papers, include a whole host of diverse topics from science, anthropology, development, intellectual history, secularism, politics, cricket, Bollywood, walking, and one article about his aunt Lalita, Lalitha, wife of a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist, C.V. Raman. So I'll English that. Uh, his published books include Organizing for Science, The Making of an Industrial Research Laboratory, 85, A Carnival for Science, Essays on Science, Technology, and Development in 1997, Foul Play, Chronicles of Corruption, uh, 1947 to 19. 97, which he co-edited. He's currently working on a book, The Loneliness of a Long-Term Scientist, forthcoming. And I think many more books are on their way. Uh, 
This is all from you know, the, the net. So my understanding is that the, the guiding thread of Shiv's academic work is in all its diversity has been the intertwining of science and politics, both very broadly conceived, and the effects on society in general, and in particular on Indian society and polity. Also central to his thinking are the concepts of pluralism and imagination, which weave through most of his writings in one way or another. <coughs> One reviewer of his book, A Carnival for Science, remarks that Professor Viswanathan is one of India's finest postmodern critics of science. Though I do not think she would like to be so labeled because the term itself is problematic. He writes, the, the reviewer, that the book which skillfully intertwines literary analysis, cultural criticism, and history, <coughs> excuse me, is devoted to the developing agenda of modern science, explicitly identifying modernism, development, and science as interlinked and potentially genocidal forces in the world. The book argues that science and politics are inseparable. To localize science would also have the effect of decentralizing government. <coughs> the book, I think, is not available. I Google, it costs $200 in Google uh, USA, but let's see what it costs now. Uh, it was in this book, the book, A Kind of Science, that he coined the term cognitive justice, which is now used in diverse disciplines and also in, in policies all over the world, so not only in India. Now, what is that? To quote from his article, in search of cognitive justice. Cognitive justice recognizes the right of different forms of knowledge to coexist, but also adds that this plurality needs to go beyond tolerance or liberalism to an active recognition for the need for diversity. It demands recognition of knowledge not only as methods, but as ways of life. This presupposes that knowledge is embedded in the ecology of knowledges, where each knowledge has its place, its claim to a cosmology, its sense as a form of life. In this sense, knowledge is not something to be abstracted from a culture as way of life, as a life form, it is connected to livelihood, a life cycle, a lifestyle. It determines life chances. I'm quoting some more again. The idea of cognitive justice offers a democratic imagination with a non-market, non-competitive view of the world, where a citizen takes both power and knowledge into his own hands. So another quote from the same book, the, uh, the article, the dialogue of science of East and West need no longer be conducted across the di old dichotomies of tradition and modernity, of development and underdevelopment. Nor can you survive on the categories the West provides us in terms of democracy, property or rights. The words we borrowed from it may have very different career graphs. Thus, we need thought experiments that disturbs both worlds, the West and the East. He ends his article, not article, the necessity of corruption. With these words, which is surely even more applicable to Nepal, I quote, for too long, we have either outsourced or hypothecated our imagination to the World Bank or Transparency International. In Nepal's case, we could say that we have 
forever. Outsource our imagination to one and all foreign institutions with money to spend, with devastating consequences for all of us. So I believe that very, very strongly. <laughs> it is from this perspective of offering alternative imaginations to the dominant ones, both Western and Indian, that Shiv has been working all these years. His work on secularism should be seen in this light. Today's lecture will offer a non-Western reading of the history of secularism. Now, you'll elaborate on this <coughs> in the lecture. But before I end, allow me to quote from one of his newspaper articles. It's called, In Praise of Walking. <coughs> this is uh, 2014. It's not a different topic, but I think it's worth reflecting on, especially during these days of fuel shortage. And I quote before I end. Walking is the poetry of self and community, of loneliness and friendship, which no society can do without. It is the gentlest toast to life and living. Thank you. Thank you, Pradi. First, for making me more respectable than I am. I was so absent-minded, I forgot to correct the thing that I've actually been thrown out as vice dean and professor of public policy over the last week. I want to state that because that probably explains why the word nomad is used. My friends coined it because every time they put a designation, they found I've been dismissed from the post. I want to begin by stating my biases because I hope we can engage here in a different way. I'm a historian of science. I come from a scientific family, and I've tried to follow the travails of science in India. What is the relation between science and democracy? What is the relationship between science and religion? I have to state a second bias. I spent 10 years investigating Prime Minister Narendra Modi for genocidal activities in Gujarat, and I was thrown out of Gujarat after conducting the 10th anniversary memorial of Esan Jafri. I want these biases to be clear, and I want to make a third bias clear. I'm tired of Western sociology. I love the West. But I think the West we are talking about is a narrow, official West, and needs to be redeemed. So in fact, I was reminded of Gandhi when he was first asked by a Western journalist, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, it would be a good idea. Sometimes, when people ask me, what do you think of secularism in India, I think it would also be a good idea. I want to state this clearly, because to a certain extent, the new work that I'm doing on secularism stems from the work that a whole series of scholars across the world are doing to seek for a new epistemology for the South. Can we coin a different set of concepts a different kind of language with the same words capture a different kind of story and a different kind of life world. I think this is absolutely essential. In fact, part of this collaboration comes with my Portuguese friend, Boaventura dos Santos, who in fact coined the word epistemologies of the South. The word epistemology doesn't have anything to do with an arid idea of testing in a laboratory. It is about ways of life, ways of knowing, ways of doing, which in a way add to the democratic imagination. So the question I'm going to pose myself today is, where does secularism stand at the beginning of the 21st century? Because the 21st century has been a period of transition. In fact, if you compare it with the 20th century, the 20th century has been a period of certainty, of revolution, of nationalism. But something very strange, every great movement that began in the 20th century faded out. The Bolshevik Revolution, to use Lenin's favorite term, belongs to the dustbin of history. The Maoist Revolution turned genocidal. The Indian National Movement is at a dead end. Castro is gerontocratic. Che is an advertisement. 
even the moments for which I had great expectations. I spent 10 years going to South Africa to work with the ANC. The great movement of Nelson Mandela has reached a stalemate. In fact, all the great certainties of the 20th century are dead. And what we face is the 21st century, which is much more thoughtful, much more self-reflective, but proceeding to do an exercise we should have done a long time ago. The beginning of the 20th century is, begins with a ritual where we exorcise the old concepts we took for granted. Democracy, secularism, justice, law. If you take any one of these terms today, we are re-examining these terms to find out where they stand, what kind of values they offer, and what kind of worlds would they allow us to live in. My idea of secularism is located within that period. It's experimental. And so what I'm going to offer you is a playful narrative. If you want something official or officious, I think it's time we stop. The, what I'm going to do is to do something very simple. I'm going to look first to emphasize that secularism was crucial to Indian politics. In fact, if you take the recent history of politics, parties have either risen or fallen because of secularism. Take the Congress, pretentious little party that it is today, it was a great affair. And if you look at it, the Congress declined. In fact, one index of the Congress's de uh, descent into politics is secularism. Secularism was too much of an elite affair. In fact, as one of my friends said, secularism in the Congress was an exercise in table manners when we should have worried about the shortage of food. Secularism in a deep and fundamental way was a kind of elite hypocrisy which laughed at the middle class whenever it lapsed into religious symbols and folklore. Secularism made the middle class feel embarrassed of its roots. And out of this embarrassment came the lethal force of Hindutva. Let's be very clear. That is, secularism in its, the discontents created, which created the forces of Hindutva in India. Powerful, majoritarian forces, which in a way have led to the collapse of the Congress. In fact, it is very interesting how deeply embedded this new communalist Hindutva is. When the 2002 riots took place, I was standing at IIT Delhi, where a girl gets up and says, at last, 500 years of Mughal rule have been defeated. I think there's something poignant and pathetic about what we are dealing with. But it's this very secularism which allowed the BJP to come into politics because Ramakrishna Adwani, Lal Adwani could coin the term pseudo-secularism. It became Modi's favorite dartboard. Using this idea of pseudo-secularism, we could in fact, the new majoritarian democracy could be created. But this new majoritarian democracy of Narendra Modi is deeply sinister. I mean, let's just take three events. Recently, a Muslim was, in fact, lynched on the suspicion of consuming beef. Rationalists were shot because they were suspected of being rationalists. I think when we have a government which is silent about these affairs, I think we have to cross-examine the word secularism because, let us be clear, Narendra Modi believes he's a secularist. In fact, the example he gives is that when he was chief minister of Gujarat, in one day he removed 600 temples out of Gujarat as a part of the road clearance program. What kind of a man do we confront? What kind of a term do we live with? And I'm going to do this through three exercises. One, through the works of one of India's greatest political and literary figures, you are Anant Murthy. Uh, he wrote Samsara. He was the Bharati Gyanpeet winner. He was probably one of India's greatest writers. The second person I'm going to take is Sadat Hussain Mantu, the greatest historian of the storyteller of the partition. But the Manto I'm going to take is not the Manto of partition but Manto, the gossip colonist, who talked about Bollywood as the alternative to partition. And thirdly, I'm going to revive Ravi Ashish Nandi's debates on the scientific temper, 
to look at where we stand today in the battle of science and religion. Fourthly, after going through this, I'm going to ask whether secularism has been understood as an act of scholarship or as a statement of a certain kind of Western bias. And with this, I want to return to the whole question of can we reinvent the experiment on secularism? When I use the word experiment, I use it in a Gandhian sense that an exercise be simultaneously ethical, literary, political, ideological. It has to be conceptual. It has to be lived. It is something that you try on yourself before you try on others. Where does secularism stand today? And I want to begin with my old mentor and teacher, you are Anant Murthy. Anant Murthy shortened to fame in many ways. And the last time he did was when he wrote a book, which is just being released, that why I don't want to live in a Modi's India. It's being published posthumously next month. But I want to begin with the narrative in a different way. Anand Murthy says no concept can exist without a storyteller. Because without storytellers, you don't have a story. And a concept without a story is like a grammar without a language. Where do you begin with secularism? He said, when you look at secularism, you've got to understand it begins in childhood. Every child in India is an anti-secularist. And he gives an his own example. He was born near a forest. And a forest, he said, is a sensorium of sound, smells, fears. Where every fear needs a superstition. Where every event needs a myth. He said, when you look at the forest as a sensorium, when you look at the fact that you're surrounded by these experiences, secularism becomes unviable. He said, apart from that, give me a minute. Anand Muthi is a man who is deeply experimental. He said, how do you re-educate yourself in a world where everything is sacred? When trees are sacred, rivers are sacred, stones are sacred. And as a child, you suddenly hear the dream of being secular. And in fact, he does something very strange, which becomes a source of deep angst for the BJP. He goes to a sacred stone and urinates on it. And then he waits because he's so much in awe because he has heard that this stone is a miraculous stone. It's a sacred stone. He's waiting for the demons to catch hold of him. Because in secularism, a stone is a stone. Yet how do you reach this world? In an India which thinks differently. Indians don't live a million time. As Anand Muthi put it, we're the only country where Galileo and Gandhi exist together. To push it even further, he said, what you've got to understand is we don't live in historical, linear, secular time. We live in a multiplicity of time. In fact, it's a very interesting that after meeting his PhD guide, they get into an argument. But Anand Muthi tells the Western guide, when you want to go to the past, you go to an archive. When I want to go to the past, I walk across the neighborhood. It is this multiplicity, this plurality of time that we have to understand. How do you become secularist in an age impregnated with secular plurality, with sacred plurality, where nature is sacred, stones are sacred, past is sacred, language is sacred? How do you create a secular world? And this is the question Anand Murthy as a great rationalist, socialist, asked. And the answer he gave us, Secularism is a word that works for monotheistic societies. Not for societies which have so many religions. Secularism works in a society which believes in dichotomies. But how do you create secularism in India which believes in ambivalences? Where every discontinuity seems to have been constructed in three different ways. And then in fact, a story, Bharatipura, is a stunning example of this. It's a story of an English returned socialist who comes back to his village in the home and he somehow wants to introduce social change. We Indians love the English, social change. 
It seems the most immaculately secular concept that we can get hold of. So this socialist has decided that he's going to introduce social change in a small temple town. And the only way he can introduce social change in the small temple town is to destroy the notion of the sacred. How do you destroy the notion of sacred in a temple town? He says to do that he has to destroy the temple deity. He wants to tell the Harijans there that the stone is a stone and not an element of sacred. It's not a part of the sacramental that they think of. So he goes to his family deity, deity picks up the shaligram, walks out and tells the Harijans, all of you touch it. I'm going to tell you a stone is a stone. I want to break the superstition which says that any time a Harijan touches an upper caste statue, they'd vomit blood. But something strange happens. While he's articulating his own secularism, the Harijans are in awe of this shaligram. In fact, what happens is, instead of a stone being a stone, this shaligram acquires a new mythical power. And in fact, becomes much more sacred than it was earlier. And that's, I think, the tragedy of revolutionaries in India. We go out to create secular worlds and land up creating sacred myths. In fact, I think, one of the most beautiful things I found during the Bhopal gas disaster, where tribals came in support of us, suddenly I saw this huge shield of a man with gleaming eyes and soup strainer mustaches. And I said, God, he looks familiar. It was Stalin. The tribals had turned him into a tribal god. And I think sometimes that's the fate of secularism today. Even the secular ideas become sacramental to us, sacred to us. In fact, I can't think of anything more theological to the Communist Party than the Stalinist ideology. That is the problem. Anand Muthi then wrote this book on why he can't live in Modi's India, where he pointed out something fascinating. He said, if you look at it, this is not a battle between secularism and religion. What the BJP has done is something much more interesting. It has taken science and actually turned it into something instrumental. So when he looks at the Mars mission, Modi is the only one who can say, my uh, Mars mission is cheaper than a scooter ride in Ahmedabad. And then he looks at his ancient science and the same Modi can say, Plastic surgery was invented in India, and the best example of that is the figure of Lord Ganesha. It's the juxtaposition that is interesting. Because at one level, he's scientizing history while instrumentalizing the future. That is, to a certain extent, it's the way they treat past and present and future that makes it interesting. And it's this that we have to understand. Because what we are facing today is not just a communalist regime. That's simple. What we are facing today is techno-fundamentalism. You want to see techno-fundamentalism? You've got to go and see the Indian double, the NRI, who thinks Nalanda civilization and Silicon Valley are equivalent and can be combined. These are people who believe that we can be culturally fundamentalist and technocratically progressive. And this technocratic fundamentalism is what is the bane of India. Because what do you do? You communalize culture, but you desacralize nature. And once you desacralize nature, the corporates have access to any kind of resource in the country. Simultaneously, science is no longer culture. The best example is Bangalore, a cultural city. One of the greatest establishment of science has been turned into a technological, mercenary innovation chain. Technology is instrumental. We are not really worried about the culture of science or the great debates that have taken place. Nobody talks about complexity in science or of sustainability or risk. What we are talking about is a kind of paisa versus money back model of science that we have created in Bangalore. Techno fundamentalism is what haunts us. The worst of science and the worst of religion put together into the ideology of a 21st century regime. Let me push this further. 
Recently, I mean, I love films, but I was deeply disappointed when Amir Khan got up and said that he's very worried because his wife wants to leave India. And of course, it was perfect invitation to the Shiv Sena and other communal groups who immediately told him, yeah, it's time you leave India. Because, you know, wherever you make a statement which sounds anti-communal, there's a standard measure for it. It's called the train to Pakistan. When Anand Murthy wrote a book saying he didn't want to stay in Modi's India, he was immediately said, take the train to Pakistan. The train to Pakistan is today a great metaphor in India, where all the great dissenting intellectuals, we can add Pradi and Deepak when they step into the thing, because all of them are in the train to Pakistan, because all the great dissenting imaginations are now seen as something we don't need in this country. Let's take the case of Amir Khan's story. The sadness is both the Shiv Sena and Amir Khan got it wrong. Amir Khan said, appeal to nationalism. He said, every citizen has a right to dissent. And the Shiv Sena, of course, said, you know, as a Muslim, anyway, you're subject as a citizen. Sub you're suspect as a citizen. So the language doesn't really communicate. But if you were to go back to the history of Mumbai, if you were to go back to the partition, Bombay became the answer to the partition. And I want to look at this history because it's a very important part of the secular debate by one of the great secular dramatists of our time, Sadat Hasan Manto, man regarded almost universally as the greatest storyteller of the partition. But I want to begin with the story a bit before that. And it's about Toba Tek Singh, one of Manto's greatest stories. It's a story captured beautifully where India and in, uh, Pakistan decide during the exchange of people, why not exchange our lunatics? So the grand day arrives. And the lunatics don't understand what partition is or what Pakistan is, could be. In fact, one of them gets up and says, I don't want to stay in either India or Pakistan. Climbs up a tree and says, this is the best place to be. I refuse to come down because I can't come down to an India or a Pakistan. And he gets up on that speech and he gives brilliant speeches to the other lunatics. Then there's another Sikh who can't find his place. So he approaches another Muslim lunatic who says, who actually secretly thinks he's God. So he says, where is India? And the lunatic says, it doesn't exist because I haven't decreed its existence. But in that moment of lunacy, you see the greater lunacy of partition. 1.6 million dead, 23 million people displaced. A story of rape which has still been untold. But let's push it further. Sadat Hussein Manto, a tragic man who died of alcoholism and pennilessness because he went off to Pakistan, wrote a series of brilliant essays on Bollywood, on cinema, on what he called Bombay talkies. And he said, Bombay talkies is the best answer to partition. Because it's the only place where Hindus and Muslims work creatively. You need all the traditions of the Muslim life. You need all the traditions of Hindu life to create Bombay as cinema. And in fact, he begins by saying, it is the very differences in background which let you create something called Indian cinema. You can't dream of a Nargis and a Dalit Kumar, a Sham and an Ashok Kumar. He said, none of them could ever be communal. In fact, there's a beautiful scene where Ashok Kumar, talking to uh, Sadat Hussein Manto, is driving through a riot-prone area. Manto stunned in case he goes down in history as the man who got Ashok Kumar killed. But Ashok Kumar is totally indifferent. Keeps talking, keeps gossiping. In fact, they're stopped by the rioting crowd. And when the crowd recognizes Ashok Kumar, they bow to him and say, Ashok Saab, is there nahi, us chali. And Ashok Kumar says, see, an artist is about communalism. The world of fantasy and the world of film were beyond communalism. But Manto adds the third thing. He says, film as cinema is myth. Myth in India always resolves contradictions. 
Anyone who has seen Hindi film will know it always resolves a contradiction between town and country, law and family. And if without resolving contradiction, Hindi cinema couldn't exist. In fact, there's that fantastic scene where, you know, Shashi Kapoor sees uh, uh, Amitabh. Amitabh has got all the money he wants. And Amitabh turns around to Shashi and says, what do you have? He says, mere paas maa hai. There's opposition between family and law, town and country, official and unofficial, was something it always captured. In a similar way, it always captured the opposition between secular and religious. Not by separating them, but by actually opening them out. Hindi film is the only place where a Hindu would go and hide in a church and talk to God. Or go to a Muslim area and think of, meditate about religion. For us, everything is open. I mean, no Hindu would not go to Velangani temple to make a few wishes. I mean, we're not really bothered whether Sufism is Hindu or Muslim. Our films make us think that way. We are simultaneously Hindu and Muslim. And I think that's the beauty of it. In fact, I think Dalai Lama put it once very brilliantly to me in a lecture. When he said, every time I heard George Bush, he brings out the Muslim in me. And I think every time I hear Narendra Modi, he brings out all the other religions in me. And I think this is the power of the game. It's a pity that we don't go back to these traditions of playfulness, of culture, of pluralism. How much time do I have? So I keep control. Okay. But let me push this further. I think you've got to see this question of communalism in a different way. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about my work in Gujarat. I remember when I went there, it actually began when a school teacher, a mother who mistook me for a psychiatrist, called me home. She said, you've got to do something for my children. I said, but I'm not a psychiatrist. She said, anthropology, psychology, same thing. Listen, I, I can understand the merging. She said, I've got two children. One is 10, the other is 12. The younger is a boy. And she says, after the riot, something has happened to them. So I said, what? She said, come watch. And when the boy and the girl quarreled, the boy would turn to the elder sister and say, if you don't listen to me, I'll do what Hindus did to Muslims in the riot. Rape becomes the centrality of a certain kind of definition. And I don't think any decent society can accept rape as the relation between Hindu and Muslim. And that's what got me into investigating Narendra Modi. The man is remarkable. It's a pity no one looks at his old speeches before he became this self-centered hologram. Each one is frightening in its intensity and its communalism. I wish I could get here and play shots of that. Because it makes you then wonder, what is a decent society? Because that's the question we are asking when you say, what is secularism? What allows us to live together through differences? And this is the question Modi and gang will not let us answer. Because to do that, you've got to go back and rewrite the history of the partition. Because the history of the partition is a collection of ifs and buts, of poignant stories which in a way we haven't resolved. In fact, it's very interesting. Let me just take two stories. One about a Sikh village, which my partner Chandrika Parma studied with Ashish Nandi. And there's a time when the Sikhs are about to move to India, when they're suddenly surrounded by the Muslims of the village. The Sikhs, believing in their honor, say, we can't let the woman go out. So the grandfather gets up, takes his huge kirpan, and kills every woman in the crowd. And then, there's only one child left, the grandchild, and he tells the grandfather, please let me live. I'll fight along with you when we step out. 
to grandfather and grandchild after eliminating 55 members of the family. This is a recorded story. Step out and meet the villagers. They're angry when suddenly one of the older villagers says, we can't touch this family. This family has stood by us during times of distress. Grandfather and grandson walked to India. But the question that haunts them then is, what if I had let my family live? The grandson couldn't adjust. In fact, he commits suicide. Partition haunts the memory of this debate. I remember the journalist Shefali Vasudev asking me, Shef, come and meet this man. He's gone and watched that bloody movie Border 53 times. He said, can you explain why he did it? And then we spoke to him. He said, that's the only memory I can relive. And the silence of the partition is the silence that haunts the secularist debate. Because women who were raped never told their husbands they were raped during this period. How do you understand the differences in partition? Which Sikhs who, murdered, who raped the woman married them. Bengalis who raped the woman murdered them. And Sindhis were too busy doing business. But the different stereotypes gave you different styles and memories. Of course, the government of India had to be inane. It separated all the families of Sikhs who had married the women they raped. Because they felt Hindus and Muslims should be separate. The governmentalization of secularism is what haunts me. Let me push this further. Let me push it to the kind of debates that took place around the scientific temper debates. Because the whole question of, are science and religion together? Actually, there was never a problem of science and religion in India. If you look at it, Ramanujan, the mathematician, I remember him telling Thomas Hardy, the Hardy, Hardy used to come to him and say, how did you solve this problem, Ramanujan? And Ramanujan would smile weakly and say, the goddess Namakal came to me in a dream, rolled out her tongue, and the theorem was written on it. You look at the history of science. Then you go to J.C. Bose, who people were puzzled where he got his new works challenging the whole mechanistic idea of life. And he said, oh, I borrowed it from the Bengali Shakta tradition. Science and religion always in a conversation in India. And the thing is, if you look at the history of science, we produce two appalling opposites. The left produced what is called the scientific temper debates. Ghastly, utterly illiterate. Because for the left, science was an ideology. You know, you're going to, I'm going to make one irony here. The man who introduced science as ideology to India, Desmond Bernal, didn't think so. Bernal and Needham had a different idea of science and religion. In fact, Needham actually said, you know, the trouble with Marxism is it's in German. I have to translate it into English. Bernal, in fact, I remember him sitting with my father once when they were uh, sort of boating around the lake, and he suddenly turned around and told, wish, don't fool with nature, it'll always pay you back. But the Bernalians in India thought of science and the scientific temper as if it was a vaccine you inject into a people so it'll stop them from being superstitious. So the left had no understanding of science. And the right actually thought science was something that you can commodify. In fact, it's very interesting. I remember when uh, the Minister of Health went to Raman Institute and the director showed him all the great works in astronomy. The minister drew the director aside and said, do me a favor. Tell everyone astrology and astronomy are continuous. He said, you mean that's all you want? This is a government which actually believes that our ancient science was scientific. It's not bothered about current day science. And as a result, it is completely unaware of the scientific debates that have gone on. The question I really want to ask is, when you see each of these debates reaching a certain kind of strange dead end, caught between ideological impasses, what dialogue is almost impossible. Do we question the way we are conducting the debate? And do we include in it the possibility of looking at the concept in a different way? I think this is very important because as a historian of science, I want to challenge the history of secularism. 
In fact, if you look at the history of the secular debate, you'll actually see it's one of the most provincial debates in Western history, which is amazing. Because if you look at the wider debates that someone like Alfred Wallace or Deleuze had later, this is nothing, it's illiterate. It was a kind of problem solving between Protestantism and Catholicism. It was not a dialogue of religions. So what we had is a provincial kind of problem solving accompanied by a false history of the conflict of science and religion because apart from Catholicism, no great religion had a cosmological quarrel with science. You can take the idea of evolution. Only Christianity had its doubts about scientific theory. No other cosmology challenges or has a battle with science as cosmology. Because science as cosmology appears from religion as cosmology. So can we set this debate differently? We always begin with the question of secularism. But I think if you look at the history of the West, the real magical date is 1492. The beginning of Columbus. The beginning of what we call the new modernity. But it's also the beginning, 1492, is also historically, for anyone who looks at it, the be uh, beginning, the end of Moorish Spain. And Moorish Spain, if you look at it in the history of the West, was a fascinating idea. If you look at the new work done by Western historians, the defeat of Granada was something stunning because Granada was the last space of heterogeneity in the West where Jew, Christian, and Muslim worked together translating each other's works. Granada was as polyphonic as a novel. So the beginning of the death of Granada is the beginning of the death of heterogeneity in the West. Inquisition follows, crusades follow, because to a certain extent, the possibility of heterogeneity is what we had to explore in the West. Instead, what we looked at was a reductionist Western history, which we transferred to our own countries. And by transplanting the idiocy of Western concepts, rather than the sheer plurality and genius of a more genealogical West, I think we destroyed the West in India. I think this is something we have to understand. It is not an anti-Western tirade. It's an attempt to understand that Indians misread the West. And after having misread the West, we refight the West in India in terms of an officialdom of categories which need to be challenged. Well, let's look at the debates today. If we look at the debates in the West, science, in fact, is encountering the sacred. Science is encountering the sacred through ecology, through thermodynamics, through the whole questions of cosmology. Because today you know science is not a certain domain of knowledge. Science is based on risk, it's based on complexity, it's based on self-organization, all of which needs terms of a different order. As a historian of science, one senses the deep need for science to be religious, except in India. I think this is really the tragedy of it all. We are confronting a society where a provincial, conflictual history of the West has played havoc. And I think what we need to do is to create a new epistemology of the West, a new epistemology of the South, where democracy, religion, secularism, science are reread as categories in terms of multiple genealogies. Let me just give you a simple example. Everyone talks about the history of liberty and equality. Brilliant. But very few look at the history of diversity in the West. But if you were to look at the history of science, take the look of a man like Alfred Wallace, great feminist, great socialist, one of the first advocates of Indian independence. Wallace wrote a wonderful book called the, a tremendous book called The Wonderful Century. The first 200 pages are a celebration of Western science. And then he stops and says, that a science at its moment of victory becomes totalitarian. So it's inherent to the very structure of science to recreate alternatives. Diversity is the essence of both science and evolution. It's not the survival of the fittest. It is not the dichotomous world of the Darwinian idea. 
it is the notion of diversity and it's the role of science to keep diversity alive. Few historians of science talk about this. In fact, it's very interesting that the wonderful century, the second half of the book is about all the hypotheses that Western science did not consider because it was sort of spiritualist, psychological, religious, or pseudo-Christian. Wallace, by examining each one of these histories, shows new possibilities. And this is really what I'm about to say, that we need a new epistemology of the South. It can't be done in terms of an immediacy of politics, because the answers will be the same. Our heroes will be boringly predictable. We have to invent alternatives. How do you create secularism in a world with five, six, seven religions? That's the question. Do we do it by, first of all, affirming all the religions? Let's take it. Look at the debate of medical systems, which is actually a debate of religions. Ail Basham, in fact, put it brilliantly. He said, whatever the dialogue of religions, the dialogue of medicines was never communal. Ayurveda, Yunani, homeopathy, allopathy, always coexisted together in a conversation which was epistemologically brilliant and religiously significant. What haunts secularism is bad scholarship, third-rate politics, and fourth-rate to academics who keep old debates alive. I think it's time we challenge it by admitting we were wrong, admitting the possibility of a different kind of politics, and to say as part of the new epistemologies of the South that the nations of Sark have something to teach on religion and science to the countries of G7. That's when democracy begins. Thank you.